Father, we thank you for health of soul tonight. I think of Wesley's hymn when he said, To perfect health restore my soul, to perfect holiness and love. Lord, we thank you that you are the one, as the psalmist says, who healeth all our diseases, not just physically, but even spiritually and morally. We're glad for that marvelous word, that measureless word in Hebrews 7.25, Lord, in which your word declares, He is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by him. As we sang this hymn, Lord, I am pressing on the upward way. New heights I am getting every day, still praying as I onward bound. I want to scale the utmost height. Lord, as, as we sang that, my mind flashed across those wonderful people listed there in Hebrews 11. Some of them had to leap across a chasm, as it were, but they found faith to do it. Others discovered that their faith did not remove mountains, but you gave them strength and courage to climb over them. And that word recurs in that epistle, they endured as seeing him who is invisible. Lord, I'm afraid so many of us have seen the things out about us. People are seeing change that they can't account for. Circumstances they never dreamed of. But Lord, we bless you that through Jesus we can be more than conquerors through him that loved us. We thank you for every precious believer in the world tonight. We're surely a minority in a minority. But Lord, we bless you. You have many tonight in many kindreds and people and nations and tongues that have been redeemed <coughs> from all iniquity. You put a new song in their mouths, even praises unto our God. Think of the psalmist says, He lifted me up from a horrible pit. Not only lifted me up, he set me up on a rock and attuned me up because he had to put a new song in my mouth. Lord, we thank you are in this business of making bad things into good, totally transforming. Again, we bless you for this uttermost salvation. It is a fountain full and free, pure, exhaustless, ever-flowing, wondrous grace, it reaches me. Lord, I think of the apostle with all his fabulous theology, the magnificence of his conception of redemption and of God, and all he wrote to us in our letter to the Thessalonians that the Lord will come with 10,000 of his saints. And Lord, we think of that moment. We don't hear much about it. It's put on one side, even by the redeemed. But Lord, we know you're coming to take charge in a new and wonderful way. Not to set up a temporal kingdom, but an eternal kingdom. We thank you for the saints who have gone before us. We have to sing, Lord, in truth, brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We think again of Hebrews where it says they were martyred. They endured affliction. They were persecuted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. The world thought they weren't worthy to live in it. And you turned it round and said the world isn't worthy of them. And you took them through the fire and the flood and the flame and the persecution and the trial to shape their characters for eternity. Lord, we're glad you're not capricious. You don't play tricks. You have a perfect plan for each of our lives if we're willing to walk in the light as we sang tonight. And Lord, we leave that as a secret. If we step out of the light into the darkness, we get into chaos, we get into confusion, we get into difficulties, we get into sin. But Lord, we thank you, enable us to walk in the light, and we thank you for the light of his word. Again, we thank you, this book, not only has a line of blood from Genesis to Revelation, but its covers are stained with blood, the blood of martyrs. We thank you for those, think of those men in England who put their hands in the flame first, because they had recanted, and yet they slowly let that hand rose, and the crowd jeered. But Lord God, we think of the glorious reward they'll have. We can't remember the Bishop of London and the Archbishop of Canterbury at that time. But Lord, you've left an indelible record in history that men would endure physical suffering, even to the death, choking in the flames, not able to see with the tears in their eyes because of the smoke. And yet, Lord, they did it as... They endure the seeing him who is invisible. Lord God, we live in a world where people want to believe in what they can touch and what they can see and what they can handle and what they can value. But Lord, we bless you, you've changed our concept of that. <coughs> we thank you we know in whom we have believed. We thank you that we do have a home eternal in the heavens, a house not made with hands. How we bless you for that. Beyond our concept. We thank you for the glorious kingdom you're going to set up. We thank you for the day when we shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and all the saints of the ages. Lord, what a celebration that will be. <coughs> Beyond our comprehension, 
beyond explanation but Lord we, we know that you keep your promise you said it in your holy word but remember again tonight the suffering church people like us in Russia who have no freedom or in Afghanistan which slowly bleeds to death while the United Nations looks on but Lord you're looking on from another angle there are pray people there who worship you there in spirit and in truth today they've, they've blessed you for food as though they had a banquet when it was only a crust they've thanked you for what they have though they're only rags but Lord you see beyond that you see them in a robe of righteousness and you see them again in that day when there's no poverty no suffering, no hardship Lord we think of women bearing babies as we're told with a shot and shell of hell going over them cringing there nobody to, to attend them, no doctors, no midwives and in terrible, terrible difficulties but Lord we bless you that they are enduring, enduring again as seeing him who is invisible Lord we thank you there are some people in this chaotic world who have a faith that's unshakable and a peace that's indestructible and a joy that's unspeakable it can't be rationalized because it isn't rational, it isn't natural, it's supernatural we thank you for those Lord who are walking tall in the midst of adversity and calamity and tragedy and affliction I think of that get him again the part of which says of these saints they climb the steep ascent to heaven through peril, toil and pain O God to us may grace be given to follow in their train we thank you for the privilege of worship tonight grant that we may worship you in spirit and in truth in Jesus name let's sing the first and second standards only of number one if you were here last Friday you remember we had a very precious word from uh, Bracey Greer very feeding, satisfying word he spoke about the body I want to take it up from another angle tonight from the epistle of Paul to the Romans chapter 12 I think there's a change here in the uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 11 uh, the apostle has stated doctrine and now he tells us we have to shift from doctrine to duty or from precepts if you like to practice this is a very beautiful verse I remember going down the street in England we were having a crusade and a man stopped me and uh, he said, what's your habit of life? I said, well, do you want to know them all? Take you a long while. Well, he said, I'll tell you what I do. Every morning I get up, I present my body a living sacrifice to the Lord. Do you do that? I said, no. You don't? Well, you should. I said, why should I? I said, this is my body, and that's the altar. And I put, my, I put it on the altar tonight. How can I put it on the altar tomorrow morning? There's only one reason that I took it off in between. I said, the, I don't know much Greek, I know a little Greek. He runs a, what does he run in? 8th Avenue. He runs a garage in 8th Avenue. I know a little Hebrew, he used to repair, repair my trousers, I know where he lives in, in uh, beautiful Brooklyn. How many of you have been to Brooklyn? You have, it's one of the most beautiful, I mean, ugly cities in the world. But there's a great work of God going on there. I beseech you therefore by the mercy of God that ye present that word present is in one of the Greek scholars Jack, do you know Greek? <laughs> Not as I do, maybe it's the same man Present your body, the present is in the aorist tense it's a present continuous tense but he says I beseech you therefore therefore what? because of all that's gone before I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God well what has he done in the, in the previous eleven chapters he's shown us a work of redemption by the mercy of God 
There's a hymn that says, By thy love constraining, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Saviour, we are thine. You know, God had to continually remind the children of Israel, remember that you were in a horrible pit. I think something that we don't call sin is very common amongst Christians. We're ungrateful people. How many millions of people would love to be in America tonight? How many millions of people would love the word of God? They don't have it. And yet we read it, we, we, we're snack bar Christians, most of us, aren't we? I was with a doctor last week and he has a fabulous mind. Every time you say it, you say, well, the Greek word in Hebrews 11 is this, in somewhere else it's that. And he's used his super intellect just to dig deep into the word of God instead of plowing over the top. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. <coughs> now remember the sacrifice in the Old Testament was a, a beast being dragged reluctantly with a rope round its neck to the altar and it had this thing had to be repeated over and over and over again. And yet Hebrews says concerning Jesus, who was both, he is the altar, he is the priest, and he is the sacrifice. That once in the end of the age he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. The Roman Catholic celebration of the Mass is blasphemy. You can't re-crucify Jesus Christ. We can by disobedience and rebellion, but the way they take it, no, it's false. In fact, I've been in many countries, seen many kinds of religion. There's only one religion in the world where they eat their own God, and that's the Catholics. And they're supposed to be super. How can you eat God? How can you drink his blood? But he says, present your body a living sacrifice. You get bound to an altar. You get to the place where he says, you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now you know this man, everything this man has has passion in it and power and purpose. Why does he say, uh, you know friends, I advise you to yield all you have to God. Uh, it's a good word of advice to you. It doesn't say that. It says, I beseech you. Or it's translated, I exhort you. I suggest to you that you have no obligation to do anything else. Look at the mercies of God in the previous chapter. You were outside the commonwealth and he brought you inside. We were under the curse, now we're under the blessing. We were lost, we were found. Well, in the light of all he's... Look, he's saying this. All the previous 11 chapters, he was laying down his life. Now you turn it round and lay down your life for him. He was a living sacrifice for 30 years. Now from here out, you'll be a living sacrifice. And he says, present your body a living sacrifice. He says a lot about his body. You know, history says that he was about five feet one, hunchbacked, and a big nose. So take courage if you have any defaults. The body. Elsewhere he says, if you remember, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? In Philippians 1.20 he says that Christ may be magnified by my body. Not my intellect, my body. The flowers are dying, they are in our yard. They haven't started growing in Dales yet. But there's some lovely little flowers out in the field called dandelions. Not very nice. You go to hospital, you don't, don't take a bunch of dandelions, do you, to anybody? Except your mother-in-law maybe, but anyhow. When they come out next time, get one and magnify it. And it's the most gorgeous flower you could ever think of. The way that God has built that little flower that cows tread on it and ignore it. It's beautiful. But you have to put something between that dandelion and your eye. With your 20-20 vision you can't see it. You slip that glass in between and suddenly the thing is gorgeous, magnificent. And Paul says that Christ may be magnified. That my lifestyle may increase the beauty and the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, that's all we're here for. We're not here to be rich or famous or something. We're here to give God pleasure. Right. What pleasure do you get out of your life today? Displeasure when we get dissatisfied. You know, we should be the happiest people on earth. I'm afraid we're not. But it says that Christ may be magnified through my body, whether by life or by death. 
That's in Philippians 1.20. In 1 Corinthians 9.21 he says, I keep my body under. You see, he was in control. What was it the Greeks used to say? Man know thyself. The scripture says that under the Spirit of God, man control yourself. I bring my body. Do we sing that hymn? I've forgotten whether we sing it here in England. All to Jesus I surrender. Do we sing that? All to him, him I freely give. I will ever live and trust him. Well, if we don't, we should do anyhow. I'm trying to recall another hymn that won't come. Well, it starts the same way. All for Jesus, all for, for Jesus, all my beings, ransom powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. Worldlings prize their gems of beauty, cling to gilded toys of dust, boast of wealth and fame and pleasure. Only Jesus relies on us, all for Jesus. You know, I believe we're going to have to come to this before we ever have a Holy Ghost revival. We get to the place where nothing counts, there's nothing of any value at all. I've got a little brochure here, I wish you all had one, but you, this is the only one I have and it's not for sale. Not for a hundred dollars. Give me a thousand, I'll consider it. And I'll give the money to missions. There's a man on TV, it used to be called Carl Sagan. How many of you have seen him? Carl Sagan, snobbish, aristocratic, fool of a man. He's the only one living that was there when the world began. <laughs> he witnessed it. 15 billion years ago, he was there. In fact, he gave advice, I think. He's such a snob. I wonder what he'll, what he'll leave in the world. It was an American who said, if you ever think you're getting important, get a bucket of water, roll your sleeve up, stick your hand to the bottom of the bucket, and pull it out, and the hole you live, leave is the impression you've left in the world. <laughs> That's pretty discouraging, isn't it? Speaking of that, we talked with Paul last night, he has a little boy, and he's a boy. And we said, how are the children? He said, well, there's a stream flowed past their house, so they blocked up one end, dug a hole, and made a little swimming pool. It's about six feet deep at one end, the youngster fell in, and nobody saw it. And he just came to the top, as they got there, and he said, I did it, I did it, I did it. <laughs> Whether he tried to touch the bottom or I don't know, but he did it. I thought, well, anyhow, the kid took advantage of his opportunity. He did something anyhow, if he scared his folk to death. How many of you read Blaise Pascal? Blaise Pascal? No? Good, you have. What did you read? His pencil? Yeah, pencil, okay. You've got to get that for your girls. I'll chase you till you get it. <laughs> if you can read it in French, which our Phil does, of course, he's a brilliant scholar in French. It's the best ever, but let me give you a summary of his life. Now here's a man, I think the greatest intellectual in world history. He out, uh, out invented Edison. In 1500 and something he invented a computer. Mugridge says they'd love to account to the Lord for doing a trick like that. Uh, it, this is the best summary I've found of this. Once there was a human being who at the age of 12 created mathematics by means of bars and circles. At 16, he wrote the most learned treatise on the conic sections since the ancients. At 19, he reduced into machine a science which exists entirely in the mind only. At 23, he demonstrated the phenomena of atmospheric pressure and brought to naught one of the greatest errors of the ancient physics. At the age when other men had hardly begun to see the light, he had completed, listen to it, he had completed the circle of human sciences and aware of their nothingness turned to his thought to religion who from that time until his death at 39 years of age there's a great uh, Australian author what's his name Arthur? Boram, Boram a preacher called Boram is that a name for a preacher? terrible <laughs> the worst of it was kill him but I was in a meeting once and Dr. Borum was there and the man that introduced him says, this is Dr. Borum, he's written about 60 books. He has five books and there are 20, 20 to 25 biographies in each of them. 
So instead of having a hundred books on your shelf, you just get the five books and they're priceless. I've had a set, I guess, 50 years now. They're not for sale either. But F. W. Borum was introduced in Manchester and I was in that meeting and the guy that introduced him said, this is Dr. F. W. Borum, one of the most prolific writers. I think he's written about 65 books. He said his name, his name is on all our lips, his books are on all our shelves, and his illustrations are in all our sermons. <laughs> Pretty good summary. But he says of this man, Pascal, was one of the great architects of modern civilization. The omnibus system which runs in Paris still was founded on the, the plan that that man established. He completed the human sciences. All the sciences, he tested them. Well, I've always argued that theology is the queen of the sciences. A queen has a crown and holiness is, is the crown on the head of the queen. Holiness is the chief thing in a theology. Theology, a simple definition of theology is theology is systematized knowledge concerning God as he has revealed himself to man through his word. But again, I'll finish this. He had completed the cycle of human sciences and aware of their nothingness. Isn't that something? He'd given his genius and in every realm he'd exceed every... He, he touched the... Talk, talk about the mountain heights, he touched the top of everything. He was a superstar in every science you can mention that man has. And he threw it hollow and said, it's rubbish. We didn't sing it, but we love to sing that hymn, I lay in dust, life's glory dead. That's easier said than done. But then he turned his thought to religion and from that time until he was 39, in his 39th year, he was always infirm and suffering and he molded the French language in a new way. But let me read something more wonderful here. I've mentioned to you more than once and I get profoundly moved when I think of Mugridge's statement concerning Solzhen Ibsen, one of the greatest brains in the world today. When he came to England, the BBC told him to take the lid off and show Russia who it really is. And he did, and it shook the nation. When he came here, not one of the TV stations would let him speak. We don't want to know what's wrong. We don't want to know the corruption in Russia. But remember that genius was in a bed. Pardon me. He slept every night on a bed of rotting straw with urine running around and filth in a dark place and hardly any light. And across from him there was another old stinking bed and every night a man reached into his ragged clothes and pulled out little bits of paper and uncurled them and read them and smiled and lay back. They gave that man more brutality, gave him more suffering, gave him more hardship, gave him less food and tortured him and never once did he wince, never once complained to men. He smiled at everybody that smote him. He embraced men as though he was embracing some gorgeous woman. I love you, I love you. Salson Hinson says to him, how in God's name did you do that? He said, I did it in God's name. Jesus Christ came into my life. And it was there in that stinking hole, Salson Hinson had been to these cathedrals in Russia, never heard the voice of God. And he sees a man totally lost. He doesn't see as men see. He doesn't think as men think. He's on his feet on earth, his thinking is in eternity. He isn't embracing hardship, he's embracing the mercy and the love and the greatness of God. And Salson Hinson said, when I saw that, there must be a living God. And the man says, well, Christ lives in me. He must do. No one else could bear it. You turn and curse your, your enemies. You get violent. Instead of that, you're so submissive. You are like Jesus Christ. Well, listen to this. This is the other end of the scale. This fellow Blaise, that's spelled B-L-A-I-S-E, in the dawn which followed the unforgettable night of the 23rd of November, 1654, Blaise, in complete surrender to his saviour, withdrew into the so solitude of Port Royal de Champ, and very likely it was there, on the occasion of a monthly meditation, he wrote his admirable mystery of Jesus. But this is what Blaise says. In the fervent transport of love, I actually heard the Lord Jesus say to me, I was thinking of thee in my agony. I have said such and such drops of blood for thee. The moving dialogue reached the culmination of grandeur when Jesus finally wrested from Blaise the words of utter consecration. Lord, I give thee my all. 
from that moment one of his firmest conviction was that Jesus will be in agony until the end of the world and we must not sleep until that time now that's a saying and yet we sing that hymn crowning with many crowns who every grief hath known that rings the human breast I looked up one of the great old English really Welsh preachers Dr. G. Campbell Morgan and he agrees exactly with what this man says that Jesus Christ is suffering now he's the head of the body the body is suffering we sometimes say Lord uh, stretch forth thy arm how can he? I'm the arm, you're the arm if he's the head, he's the head you don't have two heads that's why you've no head of, like the Pope on earth he's no head I could tell you what he is that I won't But this man is totally abandoned to Jesus Christ in exactly the same degree, I think, that the Apostle Paul was. You see, all that Paul is doing here in, in the 12th chapter, he's working out, at least in my judgment, what he said in the 6th chapter. That if we're genuinely born again, you know, I'm so sick of altar calls, I'm so sick of people going up and sniffling at the altar for five minutes. How in God's name have you time to tell them? If anybody comes to the altar, I'm going to stay there an hour if need be. Oh, are you sorry for your sin? Sure. They repented. How do you know they cried? How do you know it's not remorse? Do you think they deliberately said, Lord, I'm putting off the world, the flesh and the devil, and I'm putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? I renounce all the hidden things of dishonesty. dishonesty. You see, the new birth is a miracle. There's nothing on this earth like it. If any man be in Christ, I don't care how tangled he is, I don't care how deep he is in sin, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. Tell me the people that come to the altar, give me the names and addresses, I'll go to the house. Before the week's out, ask the wife, is your husband new? Children, is your daddy new? No, he's still angry. What? People say, I'm saved. What do you say from? Hell? Are you saved from bitterness? Are you saved from anger? Are you saved from jealousy? If you're not, you're not saved. You may have given up some dirty habits, maybe you don't smoke or do this, but are you a new creation? Is your appetite as keen for God as it was for sport? How many millions of people professing Christians watch the, what do you call the games they recently had, the baseball World Series? And people stayed up till midnight. They said, what, what was it, about two weeks before the end, that the one game lasted 16 hours. Those people couldn't stand six minutes over 12 o'clock on Sunday. I told them to get out for the cowboys. All this morning they said on, on national TV that the PTO cost $175 million to build and Jimmy and, what's her name, Tommy, Tammy, ex expecting to spend a billion dollars before they're through. God help them. A billion dollars for that junk? I'll tell you how to test your spiritual life. The more joy you have in God, the less entertainment you need. Entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy. You have to pay for entertainment, you can have joy in the misery, in adversity, in calamity, in tragedy. What did we sing? It is well with my soul. The man that wrote that had lost his son. He trained his son to take over a multi-million dollar business. The son died. Right after that came to Chicago. He lost all his property. Right after that he lost four daughters at sea. And then he could go home and take a piece of paper and write, When peace like a river attended, his world had dissolved. The psalmist says, My heart is fixed. You better make up your mind. That's the only thing that is fixed. There's nothing else fixed. The weather isn't fixed. Your feelings aren't fixed. He says, So many of us live on emotions. I feel good. So what? What if you feel rotten? Does that mean the kingdom of God has fallen apart? Oh, I've disappointed the Lord. Well, he doesn't disappoint me or you. He's on the victory side all the time. But anyhow, in Romans 6, Paul says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now, there's the body. The body he's talking about here is this. I nearly said carcass you have, not mean carcass I have. This is the case inside of all kinds of wonderful things. I have my will. As I've told you, the x-ray can photograph your brain. It can't phot photograph your mind. It can photograph your throat, it can't show you your voice. It can photograph many things, your liver, your kidneys and all the other trimmings we have inside. But it can't show a picture of your emotions. It can't show your will, it can't show your zeal. The most mysterious thing on God's earth is human personality. 
And if it's corrupted, look how devilish it becomes. Just going to bed last night, we turned on the news at 5 to 10, I think it was, and they've been showing apparently a, a special on teenage prostitutes. Isn't it amazing in this country of all countries, of all the industrialized countries in the world, America has the highest percentage of teenage prostitutes and teenage, uh, teenage and all that kind of deal. Well, teenage prostitution in the most privileged nation in the world. Sure, we've more bathtubs and telephones. Sure, we've more divorces too. Our jails are jammed to capacity. It shows a total ineffectiveness. I told a guy the other day, and he was mad about it, I said, I'll say it somewhere else. Let me speak on national TV. The biggest enemy to revive in America is evangelism. We're getting people up weepy and say this, and there's no change, there's no transformation. They're not new creations. They don't wake up with all the joy bells ringing. They don't suddenly find everything has withered in the world. What's the script? I don't know if I caught it earlier. Worldlings prize their gems of beauty, cling to gilded toys of dust, boast of wealth and fame and pleasure. Only Jesus will I trust. You see, to men like Pascal, the world, he says, there's nothing in it. I've tried every science, medical science, every other science, and they're all hollow. And from here he said, every beat of my heart, every thought of my mind is Christ. And he lived in that constant agony. He says, well, Christ is there. He's grieving over his church. I believe the church in America or England tonight is more grief to God than all the corruption and prostitution and drunkenness. We're playing a game. We're afraid to get down to the issue. You see, the thing I love about this precious man, Paul, he's the best example of his own theology. As I've said too often, I used to say it in street meetings every week. Uh, what was I going to say? It comes to me right now. Oh, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Paul is saying, you present your body a living sacrifice. You know what God will do? He'll break open areas of your being you've no idea of. This is a man, remember, he's bloody, his hands are bloody. He's going to stand one day at the judgment and say, why didn't he leave me? He didn't. So what happened? What you saw, you read. The same thing happened with him. He was put to death. But Paul says, you remember in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh or in the body, this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I like what he says in what is it, Galatians. Oh, Galatians 6.17, I think it is, yes. <clears throat> From verse 14 he says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. Then he says with a holy arrogance, if it's such a thing, in verse 17 he says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, you're wasting your time. Tempt me if you like, on any level. Tell me I'm a fool for giving my genius, and he was maybe the greatest genius that ever lived. Tempt me with scholarship, and I'll tell you this, I'm dead to it. Tempt me with pedigree. Doesn't it say I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, the seed of Abraham? Everything that everybody else was reaching for, he laid it in dust, life's glory dead. And he says, from henceforth don't waste the time on me, for I bury my body. That body again. The man, Marx, or the brands, I think it's Moffat translates, I bury my body, the owner's mark. I've told you before, in the temple, the temple used to be lined up with priests, and if a, if a prisoner ran away from his boss or someone else, he would run to the temple and, and nudge the sleep, sleeping priest, and say to him, brand me, brand me, brand me, and he says, you were a slave? He said, I, I just ran away from slavery. Choose which god you want to be. So, he put his hand out, they took a red-hot hand and branded his arm, hand. Slipped his toga down, they branded him in his neck. Slipped his foot up and they branded his instep. He might be going down the street and his old boss, the slave driver, would say, See, there's Aristarchus, Marcus, go out to Aristarchus. Tell him I'll whip him within an inch of his life when I get him back home. And the young man goes up and smiles at the man who's bought him in the slave market. And he says, Look, oh, 
can't touch you. Look. I can't claim you. Look at my foot. Well, you, you belong to your God. And Paul says, henceforth, let no man trouble me. There's a hymn that says, let my hands perform his bidding. Let my feet run in his way. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth his praise. Remember the psalmist in Psalm 51 says, Lord, open thou my mouth and my lips. Open thou my lips, O my mouth, and my lips will I praise thee. In other words, every detail of my personality can be God-controlled instead of self-controlled or controlled by worldly systems or worldly customs or religious customs. Uh, somebody tried to tell me last week they went to a Pentecostal church. I said, I think there was one in the world. What do you mean? At a Pentecostal church, they go to church every day. They break bread every day. Souls are saved every day. They can do that in other countries. We can't. Maybe God Almighty is going to smash the economy so we can. I wonder if we'll ever be happy to crawl up to somebody's house or walk a two or three miles and say we'll pray at your house in the morning and your house tomorrow and your house some other time. You see, God's going to get glory out of America if he smashes IBM and every blessed system that there is. He's going to make this whole world bow to the feet of Jesus even before Jesus comes. But Paul says, I bear in my body. His mind, he doesn't say lay your mind, therefore, I, by the mercy of God, present your mind the living side. He says present your body, the whole encasement with your affections and your will. I said to somebody the other day, it's easy for you and anybody else to give up worldly habits, it's worldly friends you can't give up. They're nice people, they go to our church, they go here. But you see, the Lord won't take second place in anybody's life. He wants priority in my thinking, priority in my eating. Paul says, I keep my body under it. He didn't let it eat too much. My body wants to eat. I remember one day we were, we were tramping round England. We had no money to ride anyhow, so we walked round England. We walked the length of it and the breadth of it. We were in a house and we had, I was going to say bread and butter, that would be an exaggeration. We had bread and margarine. And about one tomato between about four of us, and it wasn't too big. And somebody got their piece of the tomato and this fellow was reaching for a piece, or somebody offered him a piece of bread. He said, take a... He said, uh, thank you. My appetite says yes, or the Holy Ghost says no. And that fellow lived the most disciplined life I think he'd ever seen. But you see, once Jesus Christ gets control and there's something more than death, there's resurrection. I use that figure like this, here's somebody standing in the water to be baptized. When they go under the water, immediately they go under it, they can't see the world above, they can't talk to the world above, they're cut off. Are you going to tell me every Baptist in America that went through the water is like that? Forget it. Fred Wolf sent me his report three months ago and he, he said we have to deal with thousands of students around here, we're committed to helping students. But this is his report and he's a Baptist. He said 95% of students in their sophomore year in college, leave the church. And I wrote back, I said, Fred, you know as well as I do that 99% uh, of that 95% have been born again or baptized according to your custom, but were they ever regenerate? Are they going to run away from the house of God just because daddy and mummy aren't there? They should be running to him, they should be finding new uh, avenues of devotion and satisfaction. But this was a cruel death to be crucified. Knowing that our old man was crucified. If I had reckoned, as Paul says, reckon ye yourself in dead to be deed unto sin. I reckon I died with him. When he died, I died. That's what it's all about. And then I get resurrection life. I walk with him in, in newness of life. As dear Dr. Tozer, I think of that man every day nearly. <laughs> he would say, well, then you know, if you saw a man walking down Main Street in Jerusalem carrying a cross, you knew one thing, he wasn't coming back. It's a one-way ticket. It's not a sinning and repenting business. Oh, Raphael preaches uh, sinless perfection, have more sins. I don't believe in a man's inability to sin, I believe in his ability not to sin. And it's a vast difference. But when that man's going down, you might see... Uh, 
a thousand people. If he's a Barabbas, you say, oh, they're going to put him to death. He once stoned my uncle or he once hit somebody, did this. And so they take Barabbas outside of the city and put him on a cross, nail him to it. But immediately he's nailed to that cross, he has no rights. He has no social rights, he has no religious rights, he has no other rights. He's considered a leper, he's considered right outside of society, he's crucified. He has no rights. And Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, I have no rights. I have no choices. My hands are his, my mind is his, my will is his, my devotion is his. But there is the most cruel form. You know, I'm trying to write a book on the judgment seat and it's awesome. I believe that thousands of American preachers and English preachers will be charged with criminal negligence when they get to the throne of God. They haven't declared the whole counsel of God. You know the, the, the silly thing that so many pe preachers say? Oh well, we're only human, we're only human. That's what the Mohammedan says, we're not human. We should be superhuman. Human. We have Christ living in us. We should be in harmony with heaven. And if we get off the beam immediately, the Spirit bears witness with us. What's that hymn, the comforter? We're singing, but I forgot it. No, there was. No, I gave you the wrong thing there. It's a classic hymn they sing. I um, have to make some notes. See if I can dig it up anyhow. Oh, the hymn is Our Blessed Redeemer, ere he breathed his tender last farewell. A guide, a comforter bequeathed, with us to dwell. He came, sweet influence to impart, a gracious, willing guest, where he can find one humble heart, wherein to rest. And his, that gentle voice we hear, soft as the breath of even, that checks each thought, and calms each fear, and speaks of heaven. I saw a man writing, writing on a board, you've got this in your heart, and that and the other, and that. Listen, I can't memorize that. I need an inward monitor. I need the Holy Spirit to constrain me. He's there to constrain me when I'm lagging and restrain me when I'm going too fast. But here's that gentle voice we hear. There's an inward voice of the Spirit of God and Paul knew that because he talks about walking in the Spirit. He talks about being crucified but he talks about resurrection life. A man didn't have any choice about the cross. There were very, very many kinds of it. There's a cross like, a, like an X and they stretched the man's arms up and his legs and crucified him that way. There was a cross that was just, just a straight piece of a tree and they crucified him this way. The worst form of crucifixion was they took the man who committed murder and tied him to the body of the man he'd murdered. So there you, let, you, you put the, the corpse down and you lay the man on the corpse and then you strap his living hand to the dead hand, the living hand to the dead hand backwards, his legs to his legs, you stand him up and say, get going, get going. And he staggers carrying this. That's what Paul's referring to, the Romans knew that. They're carrying the body of this death. And yet the miserable preachers say, you're going to sin as long as you live. Well, if that's a sin in God's name, tell me what sins I can commit and what I can commit. Again, did Jesus say to a wicked woman, go and sin less? He said, no, go and sin no more. And she didn't have the cross, and she didn't have the book, and she didn't have the Holy Ghost. Christianity is not a sinning religion, it's a victorious religion. Jesus did not come into the world to make bad men good, merely he came to make dead men live. Do you wonder the blessed book, through Paul says, uh, he talks about the offence of the cross. It's the cross that's the offence. Also, Paul says, uh, I tell you, weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. The Roman Catholic Church is an enemy of Christ, she's an enemy of the cross, because she says, Virgin Mary is co-redemptrix. The latter-day saints of Jesus Christ, the most adulterous bunch in the world. And you get all these heresies. They're not enemies of Christ, they're, using it. they're enemies of the cross, because the cross is against sin, it cuts the cross, as Martha often says, it cuts across everything, it cuts across our desires and everything. So here is a man, and he's going down the road and somebody says, Oh, I knew that man had mud. See who he's tied to? He's struggling with the body. He falls down and sleeps and wakes up and sees those glassy eyes. The corruption in that body gradually comes into him. But I see him going down the street and I see a Roman centurion. I say, excuse me, that man is a friend of mine. Can I cut him loose? I have a knife. I want to cut the, the ropes from his hands and his feet. Can I do that? He says, yes, I do. thank you. He says, wait a minute. 
There's one condition. What's the condition? Immediately you cut that corpse from your friend, that corpse will be attached to you. Will you do it? Oh no, thank you. But Jesus says that body of sin, he took that body of sin to the cross. But we re leave people in Romans 7. Paul finished up by saying, oh, wretched in my... That's a lie from hell, he didn't. But he says in that chapter, it's Christ, it's no longer I, it's sin that dwelleth in me. But go up the road, he said, it's not I, it's Christ that liveth in me. You can't be sin-dominated and Christ-dominated. You can be sin-dominated or self-dominated, and after all, Romans 7 is only about self. Take a pencil and check every time he says, I, 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 I. 31 times, is it? Fun? 36. You've got another version. Okay. <laughs> it's 36 times. And then you go into Romans 8. What does it say? He uses, a, he uses I only twice. Verse 18 and verses 38. I reckon. And I am persuaded. You can't do anything else. But you see, Romans 7 is a self-centered, sin-centered chapter. Romans 8 is a Christ-centered chapter. And I've told you, I'm going to finish with this. You know, there are two great works by Milton. Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. Do you know when he wrote Paradise Lost? Just after he got married. Do you know when he wrote Paradise Regained? A few weeks after his wife died. That's a historic fact. But when I read it, Romans 7 is a funeral march. I, I sin as dominion, sin as dominion. Come on, tell me in God's name. You see, the antagonism is be between the world. You can't love the world and the things of the world. If any man love the world, I don't care how you water it down. Well, it's something we do in church. Well, if it's worldly, it's worldly. It, it hurts God. The games they have in churches, the banquets they have, all that junk. The scripture says if a man's hungry, hungry let him eat at home. I got to a place now, I won't even eat out on Sundays. Last Sunday, where well, I preached my heart out, for two and a half, some hours, Saturday night, went to bed, didn't sleep too much. Got up in the morning, had a snack, and I thought, mercy, I'm going to have to refuse to go to dinner. Because I don't believe I should eat out on Sundays. And lo and behold, the Lord in mercy had arranged us to go to a mansion. And we had a sumptuous meal. It wasn't a bit like uh, McDonald's. Gorgeous English style, you know, great big polished table and silver and none of these stupid paper napkins, an abomination. Pure linen, it was gorgeous. You know, I was thinking, I was thought, boy, what, when we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, wouldn't it be wonderful? All the saints, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Five minutes inside of heaven, we'll all wish we'd sacrifice more, and denied ourselves more, and worship more, and adored him more. I tried to preach on Sunday morning on worship, and the whole place was just a glow with the power of God and people said there was more conviction this morning I never said a word about sin I thought about exalting him I thought about getting into in harmony with the heart of God but you see we live in such a shabby day you can be worldly you can come to the altar sniffle and say a, a prayer go back to the world smoke and drink and fool and dance and if it's covered with the church it's alright the biggest enemy to revive, and I'm telling you again, in America today or England, is this wretched interpretation of salvation that you just come up and say a prayer. It's radical, it's miraculous. It's being a new creature, a new heart. As God says what? In the Old Testament, to, uh, in Ezekiel, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I give you. When a man gets a new heart, I'm glad my daddy got a new heart. My daddy drank so much beer he couldn't even walk to the tavern and come on, he bought the barrel in the house. And he was a heavy smoker and whatnot. I remember the transform, transformation. He got saved through one of the great men in the Welsh Revival. But he was a completely new personality. The family tree, whatever the tree is, goes back about 200 years and all Catholic. And when daddy got saved, they cut him out of the will, kicked him out of the family. But he became a saint. As I've told you, the best thing he ever did for me was take me to a night of prayer when I was 14. I saw my big, strong daddy take his coat off and pray and sweat while the shirt stuck to his back, along with a few other men. A completely transformed personality. You've never seen one look at Spencer. There's one. Where's his brother? Beside of him. 
two years ago lost in drink, lost in drugs, hated the white men, now loves them. Takes a lot of grace to love us too, Spencer. But he does it. You see, we're, we're trying to get something done from TV. We'll never transform America by our TV. God wants transformed personality. He wants that man that people say, oh, the girl says he's a deacon in the church. You know, he tells off color jokes sometimes and he makes suggestive things. God is wanting to put entirely new personalities in offices, in homes. We could have covered all this up. Let me just quote it and then leave in. Where is it now? In Deuteronomy, okay. Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. These are the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land, not just believe them, but do them in the land, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God. Jump down into verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You see, Israel, when it says that here, setting up his commandments, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, they come out of idolatry. God has separated them. You know, we don't value our privilege, anymore. In the Old Testament economy, there was one man alone who could go into the Holy of Holies. And he could only go one day in one year for one race of people. And yet you don't have to wear an adornment. You don't have to put on a priestly garment. Through the blood of Christ, we can go right in. But he set them apart to be a holy people. And that's what God wants in his church to do. He wants a holy people. Not people who talk holiness, but live it. They have victory over sin. They have meekness and temperance. And all the fruits of the Spirit, they're irrefutable. As I say, I said last week to people, why should you expect the world to believe the Lord when you don't behave the Lord? It's your behavior that cancels it. They know more about hypocrisy. You say, I don't know what standard is for a Christian. Ask a sinner. He knows. He knows the standard. He knows you should be gracious. He knows you should be loving. He knows you should be on the point of being offended and hurt and touchy and all the rest of it. He's wanting to see Jesus Christ live in you and live in me. Verse 12, he says, Beware lest thou forget the Lord and be brought, who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Verse 15, The Lord thy God is a jealous God. You know, we think now because God isn't intervening in the affairs of men, he can't interfere. Intervene. But the reason is he has patience, he's long-suffering. But we, I think we're at the end of our tether as a nation, as a generation. After all, there are what? 600 million copies of this book in America. That's three for every person. Not three for every family, three for every person. 650 million copies of the book. And some people don't have a copy. As I've told you, there's that old man in Siberia I heard about the other week. Nearly 80 years of age, walking in Siberia, one of the worst climates in the whole world. He has one page of the Word of God which he treasures. And he carries it about and he goes to a farm here and somebody there, And he's led people to Christ. He can't have a meeting, it's illegal in Russia. But he cherishes that one page. And people stare at it and he reads it. And he's led people to Christ. There's a man in rags in a prison. And he uncurls bits of paper every night. What do we do with the Word of God? Dear Lord, you've got preachers who don't read it every day. Read it for Sunday to get some material. It says here, these are the commandments of God. Teach them to your children and to their children. And then let it be a household conversation, it says. As I look back and think how many of the Bible out and have family devotions. It's gone. Quit talking about get the Bible back in school. Get it back in the home. Quit talking about get prayer back in school. Get it back in the home. That's where it has to come. I asked the people last Sunday, what did you bring to the service this morning? A dollar for the offering? Did you come with a heart full of gratitude? Are you waiting till somebody bursts, uh, sings, Oh, come, let us adore him? There's something infinitely more than that. And that's walking day by day and hour by hour and moment. The Christian life isn't something we believe, it's something we behave. And if it didn't be behaving in my life, it's a mental thing. 
People believe mentally, they do not believe. I'll be preaching next Friday night. I hope you pray, Father. Thank you for praying last week. That was super. Going down to New Iberia for Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. I understand Friday night there'll be lots and dozens and dozens of preachers. But you know, I just, I crack up, I can't help it. I don't try to practice it. But when I talk about hell, and I say, you tell me you believe in hell, I don't believe you. You wouldn't miss a single prayer meeting if you did. There'd never be a prayer meeting without tears. You mean people are going to be eternally falling and never reach the bottom? Eternally consumed and never die? Eternally dying and never get relieved? You mean you believe in a hell like that? I don't believe you. You wouldn't say, oh, it's only prayer meeting. Oh, it's raining tonight. Yes, it's raining when you go to work. You turn back and say, call the shop and say, I'm sorry, I can't come this morning. Let somebody else do my office work. It's raining. They'll lock you up, maybe. You see, we're going to have to get right down to business. I'm sick to death of talking about revival. As our dear Paul says, Daddy, it doesn't take much to have good meetings. You sit and get happy. But a holy meeting, a meeting with the invasion of God, and they're having some meetings like that down there now. There's stiff opposition. As you know, it's 100% Catholic all that. And yet God is gently breaking through. And the young people particularly. I'll tell you when the church is alive, not because it's a big crowd, tell me the young people are craving for prayer. When God moved on my heart, I said to the young people, I'm going to ask pastor, if we can pray Friday night, who's coming? I said, just the young people. Well, I don't know whether the young people should be all together. Well, you'll come anyhow. So we prayed Friday night. And we got so blessed, we started praying Saturday, uh, Sunday morning. And I walked on the, on the limits of the city, and no traffic anyhow. We were Sabbatarians, we wouldn't even ride bikes on Sunday. We walked through rain, we walked through snow, we walked through heat. But I'll tell you what, I look back and thank God for those days, those nights when we prayed as young people. I owe two things to America. One, that when I was 18, I read a, an abridged life of David Brainerd. When I read it, it slew me. I lived on the edge of Sherwood Forest, so I went in the forest like Brainerd did. Tied my mother's dog to the stump of the tree, I lifted up my hands, and there were some bushes there, some ferns. Instead of going up and going up, they go at the side and come in, so I crawl in there and yell at the top of my voice and pray. Go dark of night, go early in Sunday morning, before I went to the prayer meeting. And I thank God for that grounding. The reason our dear Paul is as strong as he is, and God knows what they've gone through lately. Did he ever ask for a dime of support? There are adversity of every conceivable thing, and yet he stands like a rock. Of course, I'm not biased, but I think both the boys are great preachers. And you know, you hear young men say, I want to be like my daddy. Well, I don't want to, I want, I want to be like them. Paul prayed four, five, six hours a night when he was 16 years of age. He kept that up. I'm saying that for you to encourage your children and get them trained. They may be good, they may be nice children, but they need more than that. They need to get established in the Word of God. You young people, I pray for your young people. I pray for... Uh, Betty and Dale's children every day. It's a hell of a world they're going into. You better wake up to it. If they're not thinking, you can't live on borrowed religion. It's good to have a Christian home. Comes a time when you're facing it yourself. And if you haven't the strength inside, if Christ isn't resident, you'll go down. <laughs> Present your body. Hey Lord, take my mind, take my heart, take my affections, take my will. I'll put it on the altar like, it, like marriage. It's a once and for all deal, there it is. And then take your hands off and let him do the work, working out. Let him do the, have the authority. <coughs> As the old song says, ready to go, ready to stay, ready my place to fill. Well, I won't be here next Friday night. Uh, Dick's going to take Isn't that next week? Oh, the week after oh, I've got it wrong again I will be here next Friday night <laughs> And Spencer and uh, Dick are going to take The week after then You got that straight now? Yes No matter Is that right? Anyhow, we'll get the news round, so...
Bersama mereka. 